I'm a long time lurker and big fan of this subreddit. I have a story of something that terrified me as a young kid and until today, I hadn't told anyone. When I was a kid, around the age of 7 or 8, I picked up the habit of getting on the phone and listening in on phone calls of other people. My parents had just gotten new cordless phones and my sister and I were allowed to each have one in our rooms. I would occasionally listen in to my sister's calls of gossip or my mom talking to her friends. Normally, I would pick up right after a call was answered and would immediately mute the phone. Most of the time I became bored and would go right back to playing Nintendo 64. It was the excitement of no one knowing I was there that made it fun. At least until the night that I felt like someone knew I was there, and that's when I stopped doing it. It was a week night during the summer around midnight. I hadn't been able to sleep so I was quietly playing video games in the dark with the sound off. The phone rang and I immediately got excited. Who would be calling this late and for what reason? I waited until the ringer stopped and I immediately picked up the phone and muted it. I heard my dad saying, no no I think you have the wrong number. The guy responds, nah man let me talk to Chris. My dad keeps insisting, you have the wrong number. No one by that name lives here. Please do not call back. My dad hangs up the phone, but I stay on. I then hear loud breathing for a couple seconds followed by him saying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to fucking kill you. Then he hung up. It's like he sensed that someone was still listening on the line. I never understood why this originally normal sounding guy who was looking to talk to his friend would oddly say that on the phone and in that tone of voice. That night I didn't sleep and I quickly turned off the TV so the light wouldn't shine out the window to draw attention. After this, I no longer picked up the phone to listen in. So creepy guy who called and told me he was going to kill me, let's never meet. I had just turned 15 and it was the end of the summer. My parents were working, they were administrative and monetary consultants at a lawyer buffet, and my brother was in basketball practice, so I was home alone with my puppy watching TV. The phone rang. Me, hello. Feminine voice, hello. Are you Martha's son? Me, um yes, my name is me. Who asks? Feminine voice. Oh, it's Janice, your mom and I have been working together for five years in Le Chalet Lawyer Buffet. I have never seen or heard Janice, my parents have always kept their jobs and personal lives miles apart, but I knew who she was, my mom always spoke about her, she was the personal assistant of one of the buffet's owners. Me, oh yeah Janice, my mom is not here at the moment, what can I help you with? Janice, oh me, I am so sorry but Mr. Delgado called me. Your mom and dad are in court, they seem to be in trouble, and he is just arriving there. A fraud allegation he said, they can't call due to the legal proceedings, but can I have your cell phone number? Mr. Delgado will call you right away so he can explain to you better. Me, yeah sure. Is 12345678 Janice, don't worry, I am sure it is nothing serious. Take care. She ended the call. Don't worry. I was scared as h asterisk less. My mom and dad would never commit a crime. Or I didn't think so, maybe this was a misunderstanding. Before I continue, I must clarify some things. Mr. Delgado was another name I knew, this time thanks to dad. He was a junior associate in the same buffet my parents and Janice worked, and as far as my parents' conversation went, he was a very capable lawyer. My cell phone rang. Male voice, hello, is this me? Me, yes, Mr. Delgado. Mr. Delgado, yeah kid, listen to me, we are in quite the trouble. I am here in the court, your parents are being prosecuted for tax evasion and financial fraud. I am working with bare minimum here and the judge won't let me talk to them, so I need your help. This is a thunder case so if we don't work fast, we could be in serious problems. Me, what? But my parents would never do something like that. We haven't done anything illegal. 
Mr. Delgado, me, I believe you, I know you are scared, but listen to me, I need your help so you can help mom and dad all right? Me, I did I will try, I was almost crying. Mr. Delgado, have your parents made some big purchases recently? A property? A car? House items like a TV, computers, fridges, or the like. Anything that could set the government alarms about illegal money movement. Me, well, they bought me a computer for my birthday and my brother got a new iPad, he may have used my dad's credit card. Mr. Delgado, that's great me, that could be part of it. Anything else? Me, not that I can remember. Mr. Delgado, maybe they just took an extra large sum of cash from the bank, do you have access to the safe? Your dad said you have one. Me, safe? We. We don't have a safe, not one I am aware of, I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Delgado, damn, I thought he told you about it. Maybe it is because you are too young. Your brother didn't know either. Me, have you talked to Josh, brother? I was going to call him, but he rarely answers when he is playing. Mr. Delgado, yeah, Janice spoke to him before calling you. Me, you can't call your brother, nor your parents. These kinds of procedures are really sketchy. Your parents' cell phones are held by the police and I am sure they are going to track calls. They won't check mine or Janice because we are their lawyers, but yours are not safe, so please answer only if it is one of the two of us. Janice's number is 987654321 and this is mine. Understood? Me, yes sir. Mr. Delgado, okay, call you later. Take care. He hung up. I was scared, I did not know what to do, couldn't call anyone, and I just found my dad was keeping a secret safe from me. WTF. Since when did my parents manage that amount of money? I waited for an hour, I was just about to call Mr. Delgado when I received a call. The number was Janice. Janice, me, sweetie, how are you? Me, I, I am fine, my voice was shaking. Janice, oh baby, don't cry, we are going to solve this together, I know this is going to end well. Mr. Delgado was able to speak to Philip, my dad, and they had made a deal with the prosecution. They are going to do a home check to see if there are not stolen or fraudulent assets and all of this will be over. Me, that's amazing Janice. Janice, I know I know, but that brings us another problem. These break-ins are sometimes done by unscrupulous P. Mele, and they will take anything they consider valuable as evidence and will never return it. Your mother fears they will do that, especially to her jewelry and most importantly, her wedding ring. You need to take it all out, including the computers. We already told the judge about them and he discarded them as the cause, but we don't know if the agents will respect that verdict. Mr. Delgado is going to pick things up. Me, but wait, I don't know where my mom keeps her jewels or wedding ring, she never used it because it was too small for her finger after she gained some weight. Janice, they must be in her room, just look for those you can save, worry about those that could look suspicious. Me, okay, but does Mr. Delgado know where I live? Janice, yes sweetie, he will wait for you in the park on the other side of the street. Be ready in 30 minutes. She hung up, and I did what was told. I went to my house, searched for anything that looked expensive and put it in my backpack. I was able to find mom's ring and other gold jewels. I also packed my brother's laptop and my old computer. Better be safe I thought. I went to the park and waited. Mere minutes later, a black SUV made a turn and parked on the other side. A bald man in a suit came out and made me signs. When I came close, about three quarters of the distance between us, maybe 110 to 130 meters, give or take, my survival instinct finally kicked off. Me, Mr. Delgado. Mr. Delgado, yes boy, it's me. That was the voice in the cell phone, no doubt about that. But there was something dot off. Mr. Delgado was a junior associate, as I told you, 
and my father always said how he was an intelligent young man that would go very far. The guy in front of me. Was at least in his forties. Not young at all. I stopped, so the man came closer. Mr. Delgado, is there a problem? Are you alright? His fatherly tone was almost enough to make me put my guards down again. Almost. Me, no, no, I am fine. Mr. Delgado, well, then let's go. Your parents are waiting. Me, sorry, what? Where are we going? Mr. Delgado, to court obviously, you can't be here when the police do the checkup. The alarm had gone off in my head and its volume was just increasing. At that moment, I finally started putting pieces together, mistakes in their story, some illogical points they have made. This was wrong. There was something wrong in here. I needed to get away from there as fast as I could. But there was a problem. Mr. Delgado had company, I could see in the SUV there was another man in the driving place. The park was totally empty, and my house was too far away for a sprint. No one in the streets either. I was alone. Until I remembered I was not. Mr. Delgado, looking at me very suspiciously, like he knew something has changed kid, let's go. Me, my puppy. Mr. Delgado, what? Me, I can't leave my puppy alone, he is just a few months old, he was my other birthday present. Mr. Delgado, but. Me, I need to go for him, it's important. Mr. Delgado, we don't have time for the dog. I was making time, I needed him to believe I was still in his game until someone arrived in the area. It was still a public park in summer, it was bound to happen sooner or later, more likely sooner. I think he knew the same, whoever he was, he knew he couldn't stay in the mean too long. Mr. Delgado, fine, go for the puppy, but give me the backpack, it looks heavy, it will only make you go slower. SH asterisk T, I didn't want to but. I gave it to him, it would at least appease him somehow, if I refused, who knows what he could do. And I went away, I didn't run, I just walked, trying to keep my calm, trying to keep the charade. Until I was sure the distance between us was enough dot and I sped up to 10,000. Never have I run that fast, I didn't know it was possible for me to go that fast. As I was getting farther I could hear the SUV engine as it started and went its way. I stopped. I was in front of my house. And broke apart. I was crying, I was shouting, scared, sad, mad, how could I be that stupid? My neighbor heard me and came at the moment. She must have thought I was having a panic attack, maybe I was, and hugged me, trying to calm me down. I told her everything and she was the one who called my mother. My mom was in our home in 15 minutes, the magic of love, as she normally took 45, after that and hugged me so tight that I was still terrified and I would still be there a long time after the incident. Till this day, I am unable to answer a phone call of an unknown number without feeling a pain in my stomach, and in general I hate phone calls, only text is what I say to everyone I meet. I gave away the equivalent of $5,000 in electronics, jewels, and some spare cash I had found. I gave away my mom's wedding ring and two family heirlooms. I gave away my birthday present and the iPad my brother had spent all the year saving for. At that moment, I just hated myself, I hated being tricked so easily. Even if my family said the most important thing was that I wasn't hurt, I still saw the pain of losing all the material things, especially mom. That hurt me the most. With time, we were able to understand that this was a very long game we have been involved in for months. How did they know my parents' co-workers' names and jobs? My mom lost a flash drive with lots of documents some weeks prior, she believes in the bus, with a lot of job information, nothing legal, mostly administrative. She never thought too much about it but it is likely they also got our home telephone from one of the documents. How did they know where we lived? That summer we had received a lot of calls from different services, ex-bank, ex-cell phone line, ex-public service, to verify data. 
most of the time it was my brother who answered, sometimes my mom or me. We understood that under that pretext they were able to obtain not only our address, my brother is sure he gave it to the gas company, but they verified my parents' name. How did they know I was alone so they could trick me? Same method, with their almost daily calls, they knew who was at home at what time, and were able to pinpoint that most Tuesdays and Thursdays I was left in the house with no one else, not even my brother. I also believe they had come to the area at some time, as they knew the park had no security cameras and that my mom did not use her ring. They created this whole story, almost perfect, but it still had flaws. First, the one that saved me, Mr. Delgado's age second, I forgot my mother had just been working in the buffet for three years, it was impossible she met Janice five years prior. Third, the safe thing, obviously a general assumption they make believing every person has one. Fourth, I found it weird that Mr. Delgado was acting as my parents' lawyer, when my uncle, my dad's brother, had always been the one in charge of any small legal problem we had. Fifth, all their legal chit-chat. I didn't know our legal system that well, but it's almost impossible you are taken suddenly to court and judged in less than a day, without being able to establish a defense. This is just what I can remember, as this was almost twelve years ago, my conversations with Janice and Mr. Delgado were longer and I knew I had seen more holes in their stories once I reviewed them without panic. Sadly, I saw through their lies too late and when I was already in a very bad position. I was a victim of a La Mata Millenaria, the millionaire call, a method in which the criminals manipulate the most naive and vulnerable person in a household using an emotional bargain so that they willingly give up their things. Or even themselves. The thieves were never caught. The phones they used were fake one uses and without camera footage, the police had nothing to work with. There were no fingerprints or similar because they didn't touch anything that I kept. I was not able to see the SUV plate due to the distance and Mr. D was an average Joe without any identifiable mark. The only good thing that happened that day was that I didn't enter their damn car. Maybe I won't be writing this if I did. We lived in fear they would reappear someday, as they knew our home address, but thanks to God it didn't happen. And I hope it stays that way. Janice and Mr. Delgado, let's not meet again. A bit of background, my mother and I didn't really get along while she was alive. Without going into too much detail she was a very difficult person to be around to say the least. We had a bunch of fights but two years before she passed she cut me out of her life completely. I still tried to keep up with her, asking the family members that did talk to her if she was still okay and how she was doing, because, despite our inability to get along, I still loved her. She went on to pass away in October of 2020, and I had conflicting feelings about it naturally. Especially since our relationship was severely strained. I have a lot of regrets about that. Especially the fact that when she died, no one told me she was even sick and in the hospital until a nurse called me to tell me, her only next of kin, that she had passed. So she died alone, as the rest of the family couldn't be bothered to even see her, apparently. Fast forward to the birth of my first son, a month ago roughly. Now, I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to ghosts and things like that. I truly don't believe it. And I mean I still don't. But this I can't really explain, I was getting the shot to numb the lower half of my body for a C-section. I was terrified. Not from the pain of the needle but for the whole situation entirely. I've never had something like this and I was so scared. For some reason, the first time I've ever done anything like this, as I was crying I kept saying in my head, be with me mom, please be with me, as they put the needle in my back and the numbing started to work. Right after they started to move my body into position to start cutting, I heard her voice in the back of my head say, I'm right here baby, and I could have sworn I felt her presence in the room with me up until they were able to get my fiancé, the father of my child, into the room with me finally. Then I no longer felt her. 
the whole incident lasted no longer than three or four minutes. Like I said, I'm a skeptic. I still don't believe in ghosts. Like, I took care of all my mom's affairs after her passing by myself. I even have her ashes in an urn that I plan on spreading in one of her favorite spots one day. For the past nearly two years since her passing I've not felt one thing. Not a presence, not a word. Other than dreams I'd have on occasion about her, there has been complete radio silence on her end if ghosts slash spirits slash etc. Dio exist. But this I don't exactly have an explanation for. I know it's not an interesting story, not much happened. But this is the only thing that's really stuck out to me. This happened two nights ago. My friend who is an 18-year-old female and I, 18-year-old female too, were on our first trips without parents to Paris. We are from Ireland so it wasn't a big deal. The beginning of the trip went off without a hitch except for your typical creepy old men. We dressed up pretty nice going out to the clubs, so it was to be expected. On the last night of our trip we headed out to the same club where we had met another girl who I will call Mary, who is an 18-year-old female. Unfortunately, there was a list and we couldn't get in this time. So we walked around the streets at 1 am trying to get into more clubs but were denied again. At this point we were ready to head back to Mary's apartment, until we bumped into a guy around our age named Stefiano. He told us he knew a good spot and asked if it was okay if he practiced his English with us. He seemed pretty nice so we let him walk with us. On the way another man wearing a bucket hat approached us and immediately I smelt weed off of him. I turned to my friend and she shook her head, not liking his vibe. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. He began trying to convince us to get in his small silver Peugeot parked across the street since the club was a 20-minute walk. We obviously said no, having watched Taken. So we walked on. However, a few minutes later he quickly pulls up to us at a red light and starts offering us drugs if we get in the car. We persistently said no until he sped off. After being left alone for 15 minutes, we arrived at the club. We got denied again since my friend and Mary forgot their IDs. At this point I was very annoyed and my feet were killing me from the heels I was wearing so I suggested we go home while we stood outside the bollards beside the club. All of a sudden the man appeared again, trying to convince us to drive with him to another club. We were kinda of freaked out since we didn't know how he kept following us so well. I was extremely unnerved and politely told him we weren't interested. After unanimously agreeing to go home, we head to the nearest bus stop to wait for our Ubers to arrive. The man pulled up again, this time more frantic and swung his door open, urging us to go inside for drugs and partying. I was extremely annoyed at this point and sternly told him, you aren't welcome here, leave us alone, trying to keep my language clean to not provoke him. He eventually left in a huff. We were left flabbergasted, unsure of what had just happened. Soon Stefiano and Mary parted ways with my friend and I, leaving the two of us to wait for the Uber back to our hotel. Shortly after, a group of Iranian women and an extremely inebriated British girl approached the bus stop. I talked to one woman, asking her if the girl needed any more help. She politely declined and explained something concerning. The British girl's friend had left her alone that drunk at 3 am, and the Iranian girl had just pulled her out of the door of some strange man's car. I explained what had happened to my friend and I earlier, and asked the model of the car. A small silver Peugeot. She also added the area is renowned for sex trafficking of drunk girls outside of this particular club. Eventually our Uber pulled up and we headed back to the hotel. As soon as we arrived inside of the hotel, my Nazar eye bracelet I've had for over a year snapped. I'm not very spiritual, but my nanny has always had me superstitious about the Nazar eye. I'm not sure if the same man tried to take that poor British girl, but I am certain we were in danger that night. This is a true story about British folklore. There will be no skinwalkers, no wendigo, or anything of that ilk. 
but I think my pagan ancestors had enough to worry about without those. Some of you may be unfamiliar with British folklore, so if I had to start anywhere I would start with stones. Stones and circles have always had an intimate relationship. Whether it is a circle made of stones, or a stone with a circular hole in it, it represents power. When I was a child I was fascinated by both. There were stone circles on the land I grew up on. Most of the stones had fallen over the centuries, but the power was still there. I found that out against my will. My name, for the purposes of this story, is Chloe, and I'd like to tell you about my family home. Growing up on a farm can be dangerous for a child, but aside from all the practical ones, I had extra dangers to consider. Our land was old, passed down through generations, and, if my father was to be believed, sat on the crossroads of ley lines. Whether you believe in ley lines or not, it was a powerful place, and there were all kinds of things I had to be careful of. We had rules, and these were added over the years. The main ones were, don't mess around with the stones. Keep away from the footprint. Don't go into the core at the edge of the land alone. If you had to go into the old stable, avoid the third stall, and don't look into it if you hear any noises. And always look at the window. There is so much to tell, I honestly don't know where to start. The farmhouse was old. Ancient, even. It was listed in the Doomsday Book, and whilst a lot of it had been rebuilt or renovated, the core still remained. And being an old house, you would naturally expect it to be haunted. It was, of course. Haunted as hell. But the ghosts, or spirits, were the least of the energy there. The house itself always seemed like some kind of living entity, the wood floors and stone walls having absorbed so much history they could barely contain it. There were births and deaths, fires, murders, curses, blessings, reverence and blasphemy. And make no mistake, although there was Christian imagery throughout the house, it was pagan at its heart. The blasphemy there came from disrespecting the old ways. At some point in its history, an ancestor had tried to placate the Christian god by placing a stained glass window at the foot of the main stairs. But it had backfired terribly. It was intended to be a pastoral scene of a shepherd, probably Jesus, tending to his flock, but the house was stronger than any Christian imagery. Over the centuries it had become part of the lore of the land, and I had learned to look at it, as a kind of divination device, every time I came down the stairs. Some days the main figure was larger than the scenery, his face changing mood by the hour. He could look happy or angry or sad or peaceful, depending on the angle of the light and the height of the sun. If it was wet, a raindrop might cling to the opposite side of the window, warping his features or making them utterly blank. The sky behind him could be a mellow yellow, or a rosy pink, or a bloody red, or a grim gray. The sheep in the field could be sheep, or they could be deformed creatures that walked on two legs, or vague shadows of a disconcerting nature, the shape of which could never be defined. I learned to read the window, as if it were a tarot card, and it was very much an instinctual thing. It was a barometer for the mood of the house. But I started off telling you about the stones, so I will concentrate on those for now. They were once standing stones, but over the centuries they fell or sank, although their formation maintained a rough circle. There were many of them, placed by some ancient map, but the ones nearer the house were the ones I paid more notice to. I had grown up with them, after all. One of my earliest memories was watching my father work in the fields. It was a sunny day and he had brought me along whilst he mended a fence, no doubt to give my mother a rest. He had told me to keep away from the stones, of course, but what better way to rouse a child's natural curiosity than to tell them to keep away from something. He was busy, his back turned to me, and I went to investigate the forbidden stones. They were old and weathered, overgrown by moss in places, but where the white stone was exposed was smoothed by the wind and warmed by the sun. They were arranged in a ragged circle, some of them upright, most of them fallen, and I climbed onto one of the fallen ones. I don't remember feeling like there was anything wrong about sitting on the stone. It gave off no vibrations or anything of the kind, and to me it was simply a nice place to sit on a sunny day. 
I grew bored, however, just sitting, and started to poke at a patch of moss next to me. It was easy enough to pry off with my fingers and I spent a diverting few minutes peeling it away. As I worked, I noticed there was something beneath the dirt that remained after the moss was gone, some sort of carving, and this increased my interest. I brushed the dirt away with my equally grubby hand and saw a symbol. It looked familiar to me, although I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. Completely enthralled now, I started to trace the odd design with a finger, only for a shadow to fall across me. My father's hand appeared, big and rough, and snatched my own hand away. I remember the moment with perfect clarity, the drone of insects, the singing of birds carrying on as if it were a normal day, the sinking feeling a child gets when they know they have been caught doing something they shouldn't have. I looked up into his face. The sun was reflecting off his glasses, creating two blazing panels of a light where his eyes should be, and for a moment he seemed like something other, not a man at all. Did you trace all of it, Chloe, he demanded. I didn't answer. I couldn't tell if he was angry or afraid and I don't know which possibility scared me more. He picked me up under my arms and lifted me from the stone, setting me on my feet and bending down to look me in the face. Without the sun in his eyes, I could see him properly. He looked human again, my father again. He'd had more hair then, and his sweaty fringe hung over his forehead. He looked hot and tired and worried, and my heart sank even further. Answer me, love. Did you trace all of the funny pictures? He was trying to smile but his mouth twitched at the corners, and when I shook my head no he sagged in relief. Told you to keep away from those stones, he chided me, but it wasn't a proper scolding. He was too relieved. And seeing that false smile transform into a real one was the reason I never told him the truth, that, honestly, I didn't know if I had completed tracing the design or not. His work done, he carried me back to the house, bouncing me on his arm and singing a silly song, and I was happy for a moment. Just for that moment. Because everything was perfect then. Right up until my mother met us at the door, her face grim, a blood-soaked towel held in her hands. Nobody ever blamed me for the dog being hit by the car, but I blamed myself. In my child's mind, I made a connection between the thing I had done that had scared my father so much and the death of poor Rowan in the driveway. I felt like it was my fault. Now that I am older, of course, I don't feel that. I know it was my fault. The stones were something I was warned about from the moment I was able to understand what I was being told, but there were other things I was cautioned about too. The withered patch of land in the old paddock was another area of concern. The stones had never given me any bad vibes before the day I caused our dog to die by my actions, but the withered patch was a different story. I didn't need to be told to keep away from that. It was an area of land in a round circle about ten feet across. Grass grew there, but it was straggly and had a singed look to it that was somehow different from the old burn scars around the barn. Like the fire had come from deep down under it rather than on the surface. Officially, the older people had always called it the Devil's Footprint, and although my father had always scoffed at the name it was a handy moniker to refer to it by. The story was that the land had been cursed when Lucifer fell, he had been battling God and one hoof touched the earth as he tried to push himself back up to heaven. Bollocks, my father said, often. That mark is older than any bloody Christian ideology. And everyone knows the devil is meant to have a cloven hoof. I agreed. I was a farm child. I knew what print a cloven hoof made and it didn't look anything like that patch of land. But whether it was to do with Satan or not, the footprint scared me and fascinated me in equal measure. Like my father, I had no belief that the devil had made it, but the very idea that something might have a foot that large and walked the earth took hold of my imagination. I dreamed about it, once. I dreamed I was standing by the fence, looking at the footprint as I sometimes did, feeling the strange prickling on my skin it always gave me when I got close enough. The air was still, no birds, no insects. No sound of cars from the road, no planes flying overhead. And beneath my feet, the ground began to shake. 
small tremors at first, getting stronger and harder in a rhythmic pulse, and I kept looking at the footprint because I knew something was coming and I did not want to see it. I knew the sight of it might make me insane. Trees broke, the crackling they made as they snapped insignificant against the monstrous thuds of whatever was coming. The sun went dim as the thing blotted it out, turning day into night, and in the shadow it cast I could see my breath misting in the air. I closed my eyes. It was no good merely looking away, the thing was colossal, taking up most of the landscape and I would not avoid seeing it. I saw it in my mind though, a vision it had selfishly put in there. Something huge and ancient that I couldn't quite comprehend, walking upright, antlers scraping the sky. It smelled like freshly dug earth, and tree sap, and a thick musk that was more animal than human, more monstrous than animal. I felt it bend down to look at me, the rush of air as it was displaced by the massive bulk nearly pushing me off my feet, but I was stubborn. I stayed standing, my eyes remained closed. Its breath gusted out, so hot it seared the skin that had been so chilled moments ago, and although I could close my eyes I couldn't close my ears. If it spoke I knew it would deafen me, burst my eardrums, scramble my brain. I woke up before it spoke, still in the grip of my nightmare. At some point during the dream I had wet the bed, recently, judging by how hot it was on my legs, and I was too overcome to let out the scream that was trapped in my throat. In my waking confusion I understood that I had encountered some entity that no human being ever should meet and I was glad I had kept my eyes closed. There are more stories I can tell you about the footprint, or the stones, or the house, if you wish. About Uncle Pete, and his disappearance. His reappearance too. It is all tied into the land. And the stories are endless. A few years ago, when I was in my mid-twenties, I was working at my job as a manager in a fast food restaurant. It was a slow afternoon, and we only had one order. I went over and handed him his tray. The man stuck out his hand and said, how much does a polar bear weigh? Ah. Uh. I had heard this line before and internally groaned. Enough to break the ice. Hi I'm Josh. You must be Stormoftera. He said, looking at my name tag. Yes, hi Josh. I have to get back to work now. I smiled and turned away. Wait. The man said loudly. I turned back towards him, trying my best to keep my smile in place. I'd had enough creepers in my day to know one when I saw him. He had too much confidence, and he wasn't even all that attractive looking. Still he was really going to go ahead with this wasn't he? And while I was at work I had to be nice too. Would you go on a date with me? My mind started reeling with the possibilities to reject him. I have a boyfriend. I'm a lesbian. I just don't want to date some strange guy I never saw before in my life. Air not right now okay. I ended up stumbling out, still trying to be polite and get him away from me. He wouldn't take no for an answer. I kept saying it, and eventually a car pulled up in the drive through I really have to go now. Bye. I said, turning away and just leaving him standing there trying to call me back. One of my employees asked if I had known him. Nope, never seen him before. I hope he never comes back. If only that hope could come true. Shortly after the incident I started working nights. During the night time only the drive through was open, so no guests inside. It was kinda nice working those shifts, if it wasn't for Josh. For the next few weeks this man kept coming through my drive through bringing me things. Like a rose. A box of chocolates. I kept turning down his advances the best way I could. I'm not all that forceful of a person but there are only so many ways you can say no. He also kept calling the store at all shifts to see if I was there. He would not leave me alone. And I'm not lying about me rejecting him constantly. I kept telling him I didn't want to date him. 
he still kept coming back. I can't tell you how much he just creeped me out either. One night when I was driving home from work I swore I saw his car behind me. I freaked out. I drove all over town until I lost the car. I wasn't sure it was him, but I did not want him finding out where I lived. I could only imagine him standing by my window, which is at ground level, and watching me sleep or even more perverse creepy things. I had to put an end to this. Josh came through my drive through again. I had finally had enough. Josh I will never ever date you. Never. Please leave me alone. Do not mistake this for me being coy or something. I do. Not. Like. You. Leave me alone. The hurt on his face was apparent. Really? He said. I threw my hands up in the air and walked away. It was getting to the point where I wanted to call the cops on him, although it was doubtful they'd do anything since he wasn't violent or anything against me. Josh pulled away. Sometime later that night I heard him pull up at the drive through speaker again. Storm Terra I need to tell you something. He pulled up to the window. I refused to even go near it, and one of my male employees spoke with him. The male employee gave me a letter when Josh pulled away. I opened up the letter and it was a card. Inside was written. Thanks to you rejecting me I will never trust another woman again. How dare you hurt me this way. It went on for a while like that. I couldn't help but to laugh at just how pathetic it all sounded. Josh never came back to my drive through again. This happened several years ago now to my husband back when we were dating. During this time, we were both in college and were both working at a bookstore cafe in a nice, pretty affluent suburban area. One day, he was on his lunch break when he decided to drive over to the Wendy's across the street from the bookstore. He pulled in the driveway and was about to go through the drive through when a crazed looking girl and guy approached his car rather aggressively and seemingly out of nowhere. They both looked dirty and disheveled. The girl's hair was a mess and their skin and teeth looked messed up and even though they weren't very large people, they both had very odd, crazed looks in their eyes. Now, my husband isn't the type to be paranoid or scared of people, and typically if someone comes up to talk to him, he'll respond and doesn't want to come off as rude. However, he got a bad feeling about this guy and girl and was glad his doors were locked when they approached. They walked right up to his car and tried to get him to roll down the window so they could talk to him. He rolled it down just a crack, again, he's not a paranoid person, but I'm glad his gut told him something was off in this situation. The two start telling him this story about how they supposedly ran out of gas or money to buy gas and they needed to get home. They said that they just needed a ride to the Farmer Jack grocery store that was just a couple of blocks down the street where their friend worked. Supposedly this friend was working at the time and had promised to help them out and give them some money if they could get to him. Now, several things were off about this story. First of all, it was a beautiful summer day, not too hot, not raining or anything, and if their friend worked two blocks down the street and it was so urgent that they reach him to get the money they had been promised it made absolutely no sense that they wouldn't just walk there themselves. The second thing that made no sense is that Farmer Jack had, by this time, gone out of business a while ago and no longer existed. The two were begging my husband quite desperately to give them a ride at this point. He said that the only thing that kept going through his head was that if he let them in the car, he could easily imagine the crazed looking girl pulling a gun or something out of her purse. Instead, he told them he was sorry he couldn't help but was on his lunch break and was in a rush, although they kept telling him it would only take a minute since it was just a couple of blocks away. Once they finally realized he wasn't going to give them a ride, they asked him if he had any money he could give them. He said he didn't. Then the guy asked if he at least had a cigarette he could have. My husband doesn't smoke and told them he didn't have a cigarette either. Once he rolled up his window and started driving away, they quickly scurried away and disappeared. He's convinced they were probably meth addicts and has no clue what they wanted although he's pretty sure that if he had given them a ride, things would not have turned out good. 
Since there have been some comments about this, to clarify, the weird thing about the story isn't that he was approached by a couple of meth heads or the part about them asking for cash or a cigarette, since it's true that that kind of stuff happens all the time. The weird part is how very insistent, almost desperate they were to get a ride two blocks down the road on a nice day to a place that no longer exists. Obviously that's not why they wanted him to give them a ride, and had they been able to get in the car, chances are he would have gotten carjacked at best. And then following the whole encounter, they just ran off. They didn't continue to try to talk to anyone else. This all literally just happened within the past hour. I got out of work at 6.30pm and went to McDonald's to get an iced coffee. I pull up to the drive through and there's a red truck in front of me with a cap on the bed. It's super wide so I can't see their mirrors and thus can't get a glimpse of who is inside. I'm minding my own business, listening to Unsolved Mysteries on YouTube when I see that the red truck has pulled up to the second pickup window. You know, there is the window where you pay and then two separate windows where you pick up your food. I didn't think anything of it and just assumed they had a big order and the McDonald's employee asked them to pull up so I could get my iced coffee. I look up and see the truck's reverse lights come on. Okay, they must have pulled up a little too far and are backing up a little. No big deal. They keep backing up without signaling to me at all that they are backing up. I slowly back up too. Luckily, no one is behind me. They keep backing up and backing up until they are finally parked at the first pickup window now. The McDonald's employee looks out the window at me, shrugs, and gives me a look like, I don't know why they did that. A few minutes goes by. At this point, I am just thinking about how strange and not part of common etiquette it was to back up without signaling to anyone you need to do so. They could have easily hit me had I not been looking straight ahead, curious as to what they were doing. Now five minutes, at least, goes by. No one is being given any food. I just want my iced coffee so I am kind of annoyed that they backed up, thinking maybe they were told to go to the second window since I only needed the coffee but they suddenly felt like refusing to do so would get McDonald's to get them their food faster, and thus they backed up to the first pickup window. I don't know. Anyways, I continue to sit there and wait for my food when I see the passenger door to the truck open. Out comes an older man, like 65 to 70 years old, probably. He was wearing light khaki-colored overalls and a dirty white t-shirt. He starts walking slowly over to my car. I'm thinking, maybe he's going to apologize to me for not signaling that they needed to back up. He gets to my passenger door window, turns so he is facing the window head-on, and just stares at me. I'm waiting for him to signal to put my window down thinking he had something to say. He doesn't do anything. He just stands there and stares. He starts to lift his hand towards the door handle. I quickly lock the door. He scowls and walks back to the truck and gets back into the passenger side. They immediately drive away the second he closes his door. They didn't get any food. They didn't get anything. They just left. I pull up to the drive through to finally get my iced coffee, it's been well over 10 minutes at this point, and I head home. At this point, I have more questions than answers. Why did they back up without signaling? Why did they need to back up at all? Why did he get out of his truck? Why was he about to open my door? Why didn't he say anything? Why didn't they get their food slash drinks? It might not be the creepiest thing to happen on this sub, but the whole ordeal made me so anxious that I was shaking the whole ride home. I am not the best at confrontation, clearly. I just wish I had some insight or understanding of exactly what happened here. I am an overnight barista in a coffee chain with a green nautical mascot. I sold my soul to the siren about a year ago when I dropped out of college and needed to take on a second job. The pay is average but the benefits are great, and the company culture is perfect for a queer, liberal, 20-something. It's a nice change of pace from my day job in the youth section of a large library, and I honestly can't say that I had many complaints. 
Until I met the drive through man, of course. My location is next to a major highway, on the outskirts of a decent-sized Midwestern city. We're one of the only locations in the area with a 24-7 drive through and all that combined can make for some busy overnight shifts. I was never alone though, thanks to company policy, so I was never overwhelmed. Beyond a bit of cleaning or washing dishes, I was able to spend most nights behind the bar, taking orders, making drinks, and cashing out customers. Overnights tend to have a steady rhythm to them, depending on the day of the week. Most nights, I'd clock in around 10.30 in work drive through as the evening crew finished up their tasks and trickled out. Once they were out and the cafe was locked, the orders slowed until our only customers were the partiers, emergency workers, truckers, and travelers. Most of the night was spent cleaning and prepping for the next day. It would have been boring to the point of pain, but the headsets that allowed us to hear drive through orders also had a feature that allowed us to talk to one another, so the shift lead for the night and I inevitably ended up talking about the inane things one talks about when it's late and daylight's filters seem to break down. My partner in crime for most nights was Dana. Tall, blonde, and tan, Dana was not the stereotypical barista. She was a dedicated stoner, though, and she fit in with the rest of us perfectly. Dana often took her breaks in her old, beat-up Ford Fusion, smoking a joint in one of the far corners of the parking lot. The night I met the drive through man was no different from any other Tuesday. Dana came in, moments before her shift began, smelling of sativa and Victoria's secret body spray. I was sitting at the front counter, perched on a bar stool with a quad-shot vanilla latte in hand. An evening barista, Angie, was at one of the espresso machines making a caramel macchiato and filling me in on the happenings of the day. I was only half listening, however. I had worked late at my day job, and was busy trying to force the caffeine to enter my bloodstream through sheer force of will. Dana's arrival was my signal to chug the last bit of my latte and put on my green apron. Angie took Dana on the handoff store walk while I assigned myself to the drive through register and took a look around at what I needed to do before I left in the morning. Not much, I noticed with relief. I was far from lazy, but like anyone I enjoyed shifts that were a little less hectic and rushed. I also knew that a delivery had been made earlier that night, and Dana would be spending most of her shift in the back, organizing cups and syrup containers to our manager's specific standards. Up until the drive through man came, the night was calm. I made some drinks, did my whole, friendly customer service thing, and traded friendly jabs with Dana through the headset. The night went by fast. It felt far earlier than 2 a.m. when my stomach began to grumble, but both the register clock and my cell phone confirmed that my shift was half over. I made myself a drink peppermint hot chocolate with caramel drizzle and warmed up a ham and cheese croissant. I let Dana know I was taking my break so that she could listen for the beep that signaled a drive through customer before casting aside my headset and apron. I settled into my favorite plush chair in the corner of the cafe, and spent the next 15 minutes eating my lunch and scrolling Instagram in an attempt to live vicariously through my friends with less demanding work schedules. When my break was over, my eyes fell on the headset. I studied it for a long moment before placing it back on my head. The headset had been one of my least favorite parts of working at my job since I had started, and I sometimes felt the phantom weight of it on my head as I lay in bed at night after a long shift. I internally scolded myself, however, for being so negative. While my library job paid my day-to-day -day expenses, this one was giving me full tuition reimbursement as I finished my undergraduate degree. Without it, my bachelor's would never be finished. I had racked up more debt trying to finish my degree than I am willing to admit. Severe depression, two stints in psychiatric hospitals, a personality disorder diagnosis, and changing my major twice had stretched for years at an expensive private university into five with nothing to show for it but maxed out student loans and a trashed GPA. My company's partnership with a state university would allow me to complete my early childhood intervention education degree without scrambling to find funding and I was more than determined to keep my dream of being a fully licensed teacher alive. I reminded myself it could be worse, and I tied my apron behind my back with a neat little bow. 
I was so deep in my own thoughts that it took a few moments to register that there was an unfamiliar sound coming from the headset. Once I heard it though, my body tensed in alarm, someone was repeating a word in a low whisper, over and over. I froze, my ass hovering above the chair with my empty cup and sandwich bag in my hand. The voice had startled me, but the fear had settled into apprehension and confusion more than anything. Still, Dana and I were alone in the store and being apprehensive was natural. I straightened and tossed my trash back onto the table so that I could press the foam earpiece closer to my head. What I was hearing was definitely a voice, one of indeterminate gender or age. Squinting as if that would improve my hearing, I realized that the sound was dot train noises. Not the build-up, the chugga-chugga part, but just the whistle noise, low and drawn out and repeated over and over. Unexpected and out of place, but unmistakable for someone who spends her days with a room full of three-year-olds. Chuchu. Chuchu. Once I had isolated the word, I made my way to the back room where Dana was working on putting an order in for the coming week. She glanced up at my abrupt entrance, then turned around in her chair. What's wrong with you? She asked. Is someone dash? I shook my head. Listen, I whispered, gesturing to my headset. Dana pulled her headset up to her ears and turned up the volume a bit. Confusion darkened her blue eyes, but instead of the worry I expected, a smile spread across her face. What the fuck? I asked, my voice sharper than I intended. Oh shit, I always forget that you never use the old system, Dana replied, her eyes sparkling a bit with laughter. I raised my eyebrows in confusion. Before they changed our drive through system a few years back, shit like this happened all the time, Dana explained. It's just interference from a radio station or some kids walkie-talkies. We haven't heard it in a while, but I'm sure it'll go away soon. Oh, I whispered, relief relaxing muscles I didn't realize had been so tense. Dana lapsed into a giggling fit. Bitch, you were scared. She leaned back in the office chair and laughed from deep in her stomach. Thought you were about to see the hash slinging slasher or some shit? Oh, go to hell, I replied, rolling my eyes and hiding my smile. I won't lie, I felt silly. I've always been a horror fanatic, but oddly enough I've always been a huge chicken in the face of perceived danger or even extreme weirdness. This, however, was not a fact I wanted advertised and discretion is not quite in Dana's skill set. I went back behind the bar, with Dana following close behind. I could still hear the noise through the headset, but it did seem a bit fainter. I don't know if it actually was or if it just didn't seem as threatening with Dana's rational explanation. Either way, I busied myself by making a fresh pot of coffee and tried to tune the noise out. I'm going to do a trash run, Dana said, miming holding a joint with one hand. Can you text me a pic of the drive through stats? Sure thing, I replied pressing the worn start button on the coffee brewer. Once the coffee began dripping into the urn, I made my way to the drive through cubby and turned my attention to the monitor bank. One monitor was for typing in orders, one was the control for the register, one displayed the orders how they were received as well as current time statistics, and the fourth was a closed circuit view of the drive through lane. It was the fourth that I often watched, as it cycled through an image of static, a blue screensaver, and then a low definition view of the menu screen and order box. I always kept an eye on it because the view of headlights on the screen provided me with a few seconds warning before I needed to take an order. I was too focused on the statistics, and Dana's cursing at the trash can with the wonky wheel, to notice exactly when the voice on the headset fell silent. When I did, I was happy that whatever weak connection had been forged was now gone. It was unnerving, that constant repetition, even if I was relatively sure that Dana had been correct. I was holding my phone loosely in my hand when my eyes wandered to the top left monitor, and I made no move to pick it up when it slipped from my grasp and fell on the concrete floor. My heart stuttered and I began chewing the already scarred insides of my cheek. On the hazy, dim screen, the normally empty drive through lane was occupied by something standing there, out of place and wrong in the rational world. 
He looked like a man who had been stretched by clumsy hands until he no longer made sense. Every part of him looked too long. His torso and neck were the worst, like an untalented child's crude drawing of a nightmare. He was standing just out of the light's reach, but I could see him well enough to be sure that he was not human. He was wearing a black hoodie and jeans. Shadows pooled around his feet and part of me wondered if he was planted on the ground, or if he was floating in place. Although I was trembling, I leaned towards the camera, squinting to see the man's face. A small, desperate part of my brain was trying to rationalize what I was seeing. I did have a few exceptionally tall male co-workers, and I wanted more than anything to believe that one of them was playing a joke on Dana and me. With the thought of Dana, my panic came all at once. I knew that none of my co-workers, all as exhausted as me, would get out of bed at this time of night for a stupid prank, and that meant that Dana was outside with that thing. I leaned closer to the monitor on the tips of my toes and forced my eyes away from the man and to the periphery of the camera's reach. A sliver of the dumpster and the wooden fence around it was visible in the monitor, and I could see that the dumpster's lid was open and one of the trash cans lay on its side in front of the open gate. My brain formed an incoherent prayer that Dana was safe, that she'd seen the man and either called 911 or ran to the nearby shell station for help. Trying to make out even a hint of her shadow, my nose was nearly touching the glass of the monitor when the man began to move. Began to move isn't quite right, though. It was as if that thing was at the drive through entrance at one moment and up near the speaker and camera the next. He was staring up at me, his face inches from my own. With a strangled yelp, I threw myself away from the screen. My lower back hit against the edge of the bar countertop behind me, and I fell hard on my ass. My head wrapped painfully against the cabinet door, and a bottle of caramel sauce fell and burst open on the floor next to me. The face filling the screen was so unnatural that it took my eyes a few moments to focus in. From the forehead down to the nose, it could almost pass for a human man with a deformity. Below the nose, however, I immediately knew I was staring into the eyes of something unnatural. The lower half of the thing's face was a wide smile, thin lips peeling back to reveal more teeth than any should have been able to fit. From the place on the floor I landed, I watched the thing's mouth move up and down, and I was dimly aware that the static was coming through the headset louder than ever and underneath it all those same words from before. Chew dot chew dot chew. I screamed then, high-pitched and unashamed. My throat ached long before I felt silent, and the whole time I could see that thing in the drive through was laughing. As I was screaming, I fumbled around for my cell phone without taking my eyes away from the screen. My palm landed flat in the caramel sauce I had knocked off the counter earlier, and I cursed under my breath. I looked down out of reflex, but realized my mistake too late. I snapped my neck back to the screen violently. The drive through man was gone. It's funny how, moments are seeing something traumatic, the brain begins to rationalize it into something it can understand. The wheels of this process had already begun to turn for me when I heard a slow, steady tapping against the drive through window. It was the thing from the camera screen. It was standing with its face just inches from mine, those awful teeth jagged and covered with saliva. The finger it tapped with was a thin white tube of flesh with no nail, joints, or wrinkles. I stared dumbly at the thing, mouth open in horror. It mimicked my raised eyebrows and open mouth for a few seconds, then resumed smiling. It knew it had my attention, and I swear it was toying with me. My eyes darted down to the flimsy metal lock at the bottom of the window. It was meant to keep out the drunks, but the small part of me that was still capable of logic knew it would make no difference to the drive through man. When my eyes flitted back up, I realized that the man's mouth had fallen open once again and static was pouring out, rising steadily in volume. As the sound became unbearably loud, I batted the headset away from my ears and it fell to the floor soundless under the roar of the static. The battery pack popped out and skittered under the nearest refrigerator. Even with both hands clamped over my ears, I could make out words being formed in the static although the man's mouth still hung limp. Chew, chew dot chew. 
The drive through man raised his right hand as if he was about to take some kind of oath. I realized quickly, however, that the thing before me was holding a large rat. It was alive, squirming violently and biting at the man's hand. Although the animal's teeth were clearly sinking into flesh, the drive through man gave no indication that he noticed. Words moved from his motionless mouth, the same childish phrase over and over. Chew dot chew. My brain was on fire, and I knew at that moment that I was going to die. If it is possible to go into shock from fright alone, I did at that moment. I shivered, the world around me spinning. My knees threatened to buckle under me as the drive through man slowly brought the struggling rat to his lips. I guess that's when I realized that he wasn't making train noises at all. Smashing his too many teeth together in anticipation, the man was clearly enjoying my fear. I tried to force my eyes away, as I knew what was about to happen, but the memory of what had happened the last time I had let him out of my sight flared in my mind. When the rat reached the thing's mouth, the drive through man didn't pause. The rat screamed, honest to God screamed, when its skull was crushed between the thing's teeth. While I was fairly certain that it didn't need its mouth to speak, the word it kept repeating was garbled around the rat's death twitches. Chew, 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 chew. The drive through man was nearly shouting now, not making train noises at all but narrating his messy feeding. He still wasn't loud enough to drown out the sharp crack of the rat's spine, though, and acidic vomit burned my throat. The thing was holding the animal by the base of its tail, and the only consolation my exhausted brain would give was that it would at least be over soon. I was wrong there, too. Instead of stopping with the tail, which seemed to twitch as it slid down the man's throat, that thing continued to chew. He gnawed away at his own featureless fingers with no hint of pain changing the expression on his face. A sob escaped from my mouth and my sticky, caramel-coated hand went to the base of my throat. I dug my nails into the flesh there, desperate to wake up from this nightmare. I no longer cared if it was in my own bed or in a padded room at an asylum, as long as I was far from that thing. The drive through man was gagging on his own hand now, having eaten through the fingers. Still, he repeated his word over and over and over, forcing it out along with a ragged bit of bloodless flesh. Chew. 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 Mid-word, a piercing beep overwhelmed my ears and I whipped around to the source of the noise. Above the door to the back room a red light flashed and I realized that Dana had left the back door propped open when she went on her trash run. Nausea bloomed in my stomach and I turned back to the window. The drive through man was gone. To say I've never been athletic would be a vast understatement, but I sprinted towards the back room and the open door with a speed and grace I would have thought impossible. I knew I couldn't outrun the drive through man, but my previously drowsy survival instinct had come awake screaming and I had to try. The alarm stopped blaring just as I reached the front register and the toe of my Doc Martens caught on the edge of a floor mat. I fell flat on my face, my two front teeth painfully piercing my tongue and I cried out, sending blood spatters onto the floor. The door to the back room flew open and I scrambled to my hands and knees desperately. I was certain the drive through man was going to kill me, but I refused to die on the floor. My entire body tensed for a fight. The tension ran out of me, though, when I saw Dana staring at me in horror. I fell to the floor, a ragdoll, and began to sob. I tried to tell Dana about the man, but by now my tongue had swollen and I was crying so hard that all she could understand was that something had happened at the drive through window. Because of the automatic door alarm, the police were already on their way so Dana sank to the floor beside me and held me until they pounded on the locked front door. Of course they tried to review the camera footage, the cops as well as the corporate. And of course, you know that they found nothing. The entire time the drive through man should have been on screen, the recording showed nothing but static. Must have been getting interference, one of the cops had said. I'd nearly giggled out loud at that. He was more right than he could have known, but I held back because that and my refusal to even attempt to describe my attacker led an EMT to pack me into the back of an ambulance and deposit me at the nearest hospital. Just as a precaution, 
he kept reassuring me. I was admitted and stayed the night. The doctor on call said it was from the knot on my head from the fall, but I think it was more for the benefit of the pretty, older woman who visited me from the psych department the next morning. She asked me a series of questions about my support systems and coping methods, then gave me resources about trauma survivors. I suppose I passed whatever tests she gave me, because I was released from the hospital that afternoon, and back at work a few days later. My manager was waiting on me when I walked in. You're not in trouble, she reassured me. She told me that in light of what happened, she was moving me to an opening shift. It still worked fine with my availability, she promised. A change of pace will be nice, won't it? She smiled. I agreed. What else could I do? I had a few more days off while my schedule was adjusted, but I started my mornings about a week ago. I was at the bar, making drinks and filling orders for the first few days. They kept me off drive through on purpose, I'm sure. However, a call off near Peak sent me right back to my little home in the drive through cubby. I didn't mind at all, not at first. It was routine and I knew the rhythms far better than those of a bar. I had pushed everything that happened far from my mind. Then a white minivan pulled up. I nearly froze in the middle of handing the driver her cup carrier, filled with vanilla bean frappuccinos, because in the back seat with knees primly together between two kids strapped into car seats, was the drive through man. Through the open driver's side window, I could hear his low, faint chant. Chew dot chew dot chew. You okay? The driver asked with a concerned smile. I shook my head as if to clear it, and thoughts of my unfinished college degree rose in my mind. I smiled and nodded. I handed the woman her drinks and change, and went on to the next car as the minivan carried away the picture-perfect blonde family and their new companion. I know a good person would have tried to warn them, but I never claimed to be good. I was just happy the drive through man was gone, because I need this job. I need to finish my degree. After all, I can't work at the drive through forever.